Yeah, so as uh, Marta said before, um, clearly most cosmological simulations when we have to do with uh, supermassive black hole binaries stop and they have a resolution when the two uh, black holes uh, reach a, a distance that is order of a kiloparsec. So in this work what we do is that we fill in this, uh, this gap of unresolved dynamics and we look uh, what happens to the evolution of supermassive black hole binaries after they uh, reach the uh, distance of the order of the effective radius of uh, the galaxy. So this evolution uh, in some systems that I will describe uh, in this talk leads to, this, uh, to the final 100 parsec problem, which I hope by the end of the talk uh, I will, uh, it will be clear to you why we decided to name it uh, that way. So um, I th don't think this is working. Mine is not uh, working. And I have it on. It was the wrong one. OK, so we already uh, heard the, uh, how supermassive black hole binaries form. So supermassive black hole binaries form through galaxy mergers. And the understanding of the evolution of supermassive black hole binaries, as we also saw in previous talk, it's not only a key to test the current models we have about galaxy uh, formation and evolution. It's also key to interpret the uh, gravitational wave signals observable in the future by LISA or by pulsar timing array surveys. But apart from these two very interesting questions, it's also important about uh, the solution we can give to some uh, puzzles, observational puzzles that are still out there. And about uh, one uh, such observational puzzle I'm going to talk to you about today. And I'm going to show you uh, which, is this puzzle, which is this puzzle right now. So this puzzle is the presence of double or multiple uh, nuclei at the central part of uh, early type galaxies, bright elliptical galaxies. So here I show um, a number of systems where what we see in the systems is the presence of double or in this case in the right uh, here corner uh, of multiple nuclei, the central part of these galaxies. And what all these galaxies share are some common characteristics. So what uh, common characteristics uh, all these type of systems have? The host galaxy in the systems is, a, is an early type galaxy, is a bright uh, elliptical galaxy like uh, for example M87, which means uh, that it has a core profile and it shows the presence of a core uh, at the central part of this, there is a core at the central part of these galaxies. The second characteristic they have is that the, if I look at the separation be between these nuclei, the separation is always greater than the hardening radius of the binary and less than the influence radius of the central supermassive black hole. So this is the second thing uh, to keep in mind. Um, since both of these two uh, characteristics I just mentioned are going to be key uh, for uh, the study we did for these systems. I want also to mention that um, after we uh, publish this work, uh, this seems that there are more systems added in this sample with exactly the same uh, characteristics that I mentioned before. Uh, I said this uh, set of observations, but I didn't say yet why is this a puzzle. So this is a puzzle because if I go for these systems and I calculate the dynamical friction time scale using the classic uh, dynamical friction formula uh, for this time scale everybody uses, the known bean and remain formula, then I get a very short time scale. This means that I would expect these uh, systems, these two black holes, to have merged already. So why I see them, why I observe them. Uh, and what we saw, uh, we show in this study, is that this uh, is because the dynamical friction time scale in these systems, when calculated correctly, is actually long. And so these uh, multiple uh, nuclei could be stalled satellites um, at the central part of these core elliptical galaxies. So how we, uh, we will calculate the dynamical friction time scale in these systems? First, I want to say, um, to make a brief introduction about why in first place we expect this is a supermassive black hole binary to evolve and of course if this binary was in isolation we would have the perfect Keplerian elliptical orbit for this binary but now this binary is embedded inside uh, a stellar cluster and what dynamical friction does is that it acts as a perturbing force to the classic two body problem, perturbs the orbit of the outer black hole and makes it segregate towards the center. Of course this force is dynamical uh, friction um, and was described um, 
by Chandra Sekar very early on. So a dynamical friction appears every time I have a test body moving inside the cusp of field particles. As this, as this body uh, moves inside this cusp, uh, then there is an over density wake that is created behind this body, decelerates the body, makes it uh, lose energy and angular momentum, and segregate towards the center. Um, dynamical friction force, of course, is a fundamental force in astrophysics, and it was described early on by Chandrasekhar in 1943. Chandrasekhar, uh, though, did some estimates about um, um, this force uh, in such type of systems that he found that only uh, stars that are moving slower than the test body in this cusp will contribute to the force. Uh, this was, uh, this, the estimates of Chandrasekhar were true, but uh, Chandrasekhar didn't look at systems that they have a central uh, supermassive, uh, that didn't look at stellar cusps, I'm sorry, that uh, have a central supermassive that I call at the center. So what Antonini and Mary did in 2012 is that they looked at stellar cusps that the potential in this cusp is dominated by the presence of a central bo body in, this, um, in these systems. So um, stars, uh, what Antonini and Merit showed is that stars in this cusp that are moving faster than the test body also contribute uh, to the dynamical friction force. And this contribution becomes, becomes essentially important when I look at shallow density profiles. And what I mean by shallow is that if I just plot the density as a function of distance, then I describe this, power, this density profile as a power law, this index gamma is going to be uh, less than 1. So in these systems, and for a reason I'm going to show in the next slide, uh, in these shallow density profiles around a supermassive black hole, um, the contribution for fast stars is a key and should be included. Why? Because of this. If I go and I plot the fraction of stars uh, with that I have in this cusp with velocities less or greater than the test of the velocity of the test body, as a function of the velocity of the body in units of the circular velocity, uh, for different density profiles, and the different colors here is the different, they are the different density profiles, and as I go to the red uh, curve, I go to shallower and shallower density profile, what I see is that when I'm close to the apoapsis of this orbit, I don't have slow stars uh, anymore. And the shallower my profile, the less uh, slow stars I have. This means that in, this, in these systems, if I use Sandra Sekar's formula, wh which only takes into account stars that are moving slower, I'm going to have zero force because I'm going to have zero slow stars. So in these systems, it's fundamental to include the contribution from the fast stars because this is the only way I can continue the orbital decay of my system. Um, so the first, key, uh, the first thing I get from this plot is that fast, uh, star, uh, fast stars contribute to the dynamical friction force in the systems, and second, they contribute even more and more as I go to shallower and shallower profiles. And the second thing uh, I can see uh, early on from this uh, plot is that the, this contribution is going to affect the eccentricity evolution of the binary as well. Why? Because what matters about the eccentricity evolution of my system is the contribution, the relative contribution of dynamical friction force near apoapsis and near periapsis. So this is the this is the it is a relative contribution that affects eccentricity evolution, and this is why this uh, contribution of the fast stars is a key also to how eccentricity of my binary will evolve, and I will show what we find about this uh, in the next slides. Uh, before this, before I. Uh, show my, our results, I want to say why we're interested in these shallow density profiles, uh, astrophysically. So we're not, um, we're very interested because if I go to M87, a classic uh, bright elliptical galaxy, and I look at it, the surface bro brightness profile uh, of this galaxy as a function of distance, then I will see the presence of what I mentioned uh, before, the presence of a flat core. So these systems, galaxies like this, are described with, uh, from a power law that is uh, index uh, slope that is less than 1, and these systems are astrophysically interested. Is only this? No, it's not the only galaxy, because uh, if I look now to all the sample of elliptical galaxies I have, bright elliptical galaxies, and I look there at the surface brightness profile, I will see that there is a dichotomy that exists. So half of the galaxies have, um, show the presence of a steep cusp, and they are called the coreless ellipticals, and half of them are uh, showing the presence of a core. So there is a bunch of uh, galaxies, uh, of elliptical galaxies, that have this type of profiles, and they are uh, astrophysically interesting. On top of this, I know 
And if I believe that, uh, we believe that these galaxies, we know we, the host super, uh, central supermassive black holes, and from cosmological simulations, we have also um, um, indications that they, the way these galaxies grow is through mergers, and especially through minor mergers that is also a key for this world, as I will show. So for these reasons, it's important to see what happens when uh, uh, I have a secondary galaxy that comes and merges with a bright elliptical galaxy like M87. And how we do this? Uh, we all um, heard about that there are different stages in the evolution of a supermassive black hole binary. Um, as I said here, we zoom in to this central uh, region of the galaxy from the from the decay from the kilo the effective radius of the galaxy, which is uh, of the order of a kiloparsec in these systems, until uh, merging, the final merging. And there are three different evolutionary phases that uh, take place during this evolution. The first is as my supermassive black hole, which is actually not naked, uh, it has also uh, around it the massing stars of the uh, satellite galaxy, and this is also a key to our calculation, and I'm gonna come back to this. So the first uh, stage is when I decay from the effective radius of the galaxy until I reach the influence radius of the central supermassive black hole. Uh, and this is um, two things. Th this is a, a, um, a large-scale orbital decay, which is fast. It is fast because uh, during this evolutionary stage, I can go and use the classic time scale of Bini and Tremaine that I mentioned in the beginning. Why? Because this time scale makes the assumption that the stellar velocity distribution in this uh, phase is a Maxwellian distribution. And I can do this here because um, once I can do this until only I reach the influence radius of the central supermassive black hole. Why? Because when I reach the central supermassive black hole influence radius, then my two black holes become a bound pair. And this is where I at least say that the, but this is where I, men, I define the bound pair to be. Because most people, uh, maybe it's confusing, they define the final parsec problem. So here, my two black holes become a bound pair. And what changes is now that the, the, the potential is dominated by a central point mass. This means that the uh, distribution function of the stellar velocities cannot be Maxwellian anymore. So if, if I assume that my potential is dominated by the central supermassive black hole, and also I assume isotropy, I can derive the distribution function of the stellar velocity that's now not Maxwellian. And once I do this, uh, I can calculate, and this time scale will calculate in this work, the dynamical friction time scale for this bound pair until the point when I reach now the hardening radius of the binary. And this radius is defined as the radius where the orbital energy in my binary is comparable with the energy of the stars around it, which means in, in three body interactions, uh, stars are going to be uh, ejected, the binary will harden and emit gravitational, potentially gravitational, and emit gravitational waves. So uh, as I said, we study this um, evolutionary phase and we compute this time scale uh, that we uh, named the dynamical friction bound bear time scale. How we do this? I mentioned before that dynamical friction acts as a perturbation to the classic two-body problem. And there is this set of equations, the known Lagrange planetary uh, equations, where once I have a two-body problem and I know I have a perturbing force, no matter what perturbing force I have, I can go to these equations, I can plug in the analytical uh, formula I have for this perturbing force, and I can compute how the orbital elements of this binary are evolving uh, with time. So if I do uh, this, plugging in the formula about dynamical friction, um, and this is with the correct distribution function that I have to include and with the contribution of the fast stars that I need for the orbital decay of my binary to continue in the systems, then you, um, you have to trust me that only, uh, and then it's also intuitively uh, obvious that since I exchange energy and angular momentum, the only elements uh, I can change in this case because uh, dynamical friction is a decelerating force acting uh, in the opposite way of the velocity of the body. The only elements I can change is the same major axis and eccentricity of this binary. And since the time scale of this uh, process is fat, much, much uh, longer than the orbital time scale, then I can orbit average these equations and in the end have a secular, some secular equations about the same major axis and eccentricity of this binary. And this is what we plot here. So what we find first of all about the same major axis. So here I plot same major axis as a function of time, just giving again the density profiles for reference. Uh, in the color code. 
And what I see, and I compare the dashed line, which is the classic, uh, this is the um, prescription from Chandra Sekhar, including only uh, the slow stars, with um, the results from our work, which is the solid uh, lines in this plot. So what I see is that if I include the fast stars here, my, uh, I have a shorter uh, time scale for the evolution of these systems. But still, if I go to very shallow profiles, which is now the purple line, uh, my orbit seems to stall. So the first thing I can keep from this plot is that if I look at shallow uh, density profiles, uh, this is for, um, and I will uh, show also that this, is, this plot is for a low mass ratio. It's for a mass ratio of 10 to the minus 3, for example, this plot. I still can um, have long lifetimes for this supermassive black hole banner. So it's a problem I have to look at because I can get very long lifetimes in the systems. And uh, we will s uh, I will show the lifetime of the systems as a function of the mass ratio. Um, so first thing to keep in mind is long lifetimes in these uh, shallow density profiles. The second thing is, as I mentioned before, this contribution uh, affects the eccentricity evolution of the binary. So what I plot here is um, the, um, as a function of the Coulomb logarithm and the um, um, slope, density slope, I plot um, the region where this solid line, uh, the region where I expect um, the eccentricity of the binary to increase and the eccentricity of the binary to decrease as a function, as again, I say of the Coulomb logarithm and the density slope. So if I used Sandra Secker's formula, this is this, uh, there would be a critical value of gamma, which is the famous 1.5, where I expect the eccentricity of the binary um, to decrease above uh, in all this. Uh, cusps that have a gamma uh, greater than 1.5 and to increase below this. In including the fast stars and in our prescription, which is the solid the green line, we increase the parameter space uh, for all the values of the Coulomb logarithm that you can have an eccentricity evolution uh, incre and increase in the eccentricity uh, of the systems. This means that in these systems, um, Sandra Sekar's formula was predicting a constant or decreasing of eccentricity and we found an increase in the eccentricity. And um, I want to show this uh, increase in eccentricity as a function of the mass ratio of the binary. Um, and the y-axis is the final eccentricity of my system. Uh, the different, uh, I do this for different initial eccentricities um, for the system. And what you can, we can keep here uh, from this plot fast is that if I go and look at moderate initial eccentricities and the low mass ratio, which again I say is the key, uh, to this study, then um, in shallow density profiles, I can get a, a final eccentricities which are uh, very high. They can be for a, of the order of 0 0.9 if I, I, I start with a moderate initial eccentricity, for example. Uh, so the second thing to keep in mind is in this, uh, these profiles, long lifetimes and final high eccentricities for these systems. And this appears, as I said again, in low mass ratio binary, which in uh, cosmological concept we uh, refers to minor mergers in these systems. Um, so what we now we have a, a complete view um, of how we expect supermassive black hole binaries to form, to, to evolve, I'm sorry, um, in these systems. And we can compute the lifetime of these binaries. How? By just adding these three different time scales: the fast orbital decay time scale which is the classic formula uh, the, that was uh, used. Then we have to include the dynamical friction time scale the way we computed and I described before. And then what we use for the hardening is we use a recent result from um, Vasiliev uh, Antoni 2014 and 15, where the, there, there is a fitting, uh, there is a formula given there for the hardening uh, time scale of the system, which is uh, less than one giga year, which, which means that it is short and uh, there is no uh, final partial problem. And doing this, we can add all these time scales to find the time it will take for the binaries to go from the effective radius of the galaxy until coalescence. And this is um, what I plot here. So the, as a function of total mass of the binary and the mass ratio of the binary, uh, the color is uh, depicting the lifetime of this system. And the way to read this plot is uh, looking at the, to the left of these uh, solid white lines, the lifetime of the binary is greater than 1 giga year, 3 giga years, 10 giga years. Which means and shows, first of all, that uh, using this time scale about hardening, 
you see that I, can, I don't have um, a final parsing pr problem anymore for equal mass ratio binaries. And the second thing you can see is that if I go and look at minor mergers, low mass ratio systems, at massive galaxies, the lifetime can exceed the Hubble time, which means that in such low mass uh, uh, ratio mergers, in, the, in such shallow density profiles, I can have uh, binaries that stall, and they are going to stall, because their lifetime is simply um, um, greater than a Hubble time. How many of them will stall? So we can uh, calculate the number of uh, stalled satellites as a function of the central supermassive black hole mass. We do this by just, we take the average uh, merger rate as a function of mass ratio and the uh, redshift, and we integrate over mass ratio and redshift. On the redshift, we, uh, we integrate between 0 and 1 because we know um, that these galaxies have for are forming and growing through mergers in this uh, redshift range. And for the mass ratio, we have a cutoff of 10 to the 6. And then we integrate until the critical mass ratio that we compute such that the lifetime of the binary is going to be um, uh, equal to Hubble time. This means that uh, for mass ratio less, mass ratio is less than this critical uh, lifetime, the, uh, um, the lifetime of the binary is going to be greater than a Hubble time, and the binary will stall. For the merger rate, I want to say for the, that for the um, mass ratio uh, dependency, we use 1 over Q. And we also want to test uh, how the results will change using the, uh, the merger rate inferred by Lustris. So we use these two different assumptions. And here is our result. So here we plot the, the, we plot the number of stalled satellites, average number of stalled satellites, as a function of the central supermassive black hole. And the way to um, interpret this, uh, this uh, figure, this plot, is that if I look uh, at galaxies like, uh, for example, M87, I expect to have a few, stalled, uh, a few stalled satellites in these systems. It's an average number. It doesn't mean that if I look at the every galaxy that has this central supermassive black hole, I should expect to find double or multiple nuclei. But it's still indicative that in these massive galaxies, um, I expect to have a few stalled satellites. Here for the stars, we're using real uh, observational values for the effective radii, the velocity dispersion of these galaxies. For the solid lines, we use analytical, uh, empirical estimates for these uh, the same quantities, while the, the black points are using the merger rate now inferred from Illustris and not the analytical uh, um, uh, formula uh, that I mentioned before. But no matter what prescription uh, or um, um, way you want to calculate this number of so st stalled satellites you choose, you see that for sure the result that for these systems, I expect to have a few stalled satellites. Uh, it's a pretty, uh, it's a result that um, um, is shown. And I want to mention that these uh, stars are purple because they are the double or multiple nuclei uh, I showed in the beginning as observation. So for these systems, this model predicts the presence of these nuclei at the central parts of these galaxies. And this seems to, to be consistent with uh, this model. Um, so, as I said, this, uh, this stall satellites could be uh, a result of the stalling of these uh, systems in the low density cores of these galaxies. And since I don't, I don't think I have uh, time. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to skip the off gender at the end. OK. Uh, I just want to say that also, since uh, many people talk about eccentric nuclear disks, um, since as I said, the key also to our study is that we expect this low mass ratio uh, systems to be on very highly eccentric orbits. Um, it could have very interesting implications about the star uh, cluster that uh, is tidally uh, stripped when it reaches um, the closest approach to supermassive black hole and it forms this eccentric nuclear disk. And this is because this uh, high eccentricity you achieve is a key to, the, to these systems. And I find it very interesting. So yeah, my conclusions. And I think I can stop right here and get questions. Yeah.